the answers kind of vary a little too much like I haven't I haven't had trouble like that so I, I guess I, I've taken the answers straight out of the book and I'm still like getting the answers wrong so I'm just trying to figure out if it's maybe if I'm not studying well enough or if like the answers do vary just um, I've been like taking some screenshots of like the answers and see what the consistency is yeah between them. okay yeah because I'm not I'm not seeing um like I had an instance where I answered the question um, and then I looked at what was wrong, what was right. Yeah. And then I attempted it again and it was like the straight definition of it. And it, it told me that I was wrong. And I'm like, but this is straight from the book. <laughs> well, OK. You know what? Why don't you and I talk? Does anybody else have that same experience? I mean, the questions vary, yeah, because sometimes you could, like, do a new attempt, and then it gives you, like, a little bit of a different, like, question. Yeah. But I don't have a little bit of trouble with that, because, like, I try to, like, read the, and I try to read the questions, like, as best as possible, but once I get a good grade, I'm like, okay, I'm accepting this. <laughs> All right. Well, I tell you what, do you, do you guys want to maybe pull together some specific examples and next week when we come together, we can talk about those in particular and go over them together. Yeah, definitely. Um, I'm still verifying. I'm going to go through the next homework again because I, I don't obviously I don't want to turn in anything that's like not solid. I mean, it, obviously, it could be completely just me. Yeah. Um, so I like to make sure that there is no discrepancies. And, and that's so. But since you asked, I wanted to mention it. OK. No problem. I'm glad you let me know. Yeah, let's let's take a little time at the beginning of next week then, because uh, it'll I imagine it'll take you some time to pull it all together right now, and yeah. and, the, and we can and we can do that. Any um, so for anybody that has any questions on anything that we've already gone over that you're not sure why the answer was a certain way, let's make sure that we take some time at the beginning of next lecture to do that. Yeah. All definitely. right. The, the quizzes are very straightforward. Good. Uh, so I have no issues with the, the quizzes. It's uh, the best description I can give with the homework is that a lot of the answers are, are subjective. Mm. And when they're subjective, they're a little bit harder to answer. And it still, you know, makes it, okay, well, this could be right. But, you know, yeah. so that's where I'm having trouble. Okay, sure. Not a problem. We'll, we'll go over that. Paul, I see okay. you coming in. How are you? Good. How are you, sir? I'm good. And Marcelo, I see you've been there for a little while now. How are you doing, buddy? Doing good. Yeah. Right on. I'm good. I'm real good. Hi, Gianna. Hi, how are you? Good. Am I pronouncing that right, Gianna? <laughs> yeah, it's Gianna. You're okay. pronouncing it right. Good, 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 good. I used to know another Gianna. She was actually the daughter of a friend of mine, but uh, her name was spelt the Italian way with a G-I-U-A-N-N-A. -N -N -A. Anyway, oh, that's yeah, it is kind of cool. Okay, um, guys, let's, um, the first thing I want to do tonight is uh, make sure that we're all kind of um, uh, understanding what the, what the class project assignment is for this week. Did you see that I had added a note and announcements about that? Yes. Okay. Yes. I thought maybe that might be a good place for us to start tonight. Make sure we're all um, uh, in sync with that. So let me share my screen and come over here again let's see modules no it wasn't it was under announcements i think no it was under modules <laughs> i forget where i put things sometimes um okay And I'm showing you my view of, of the course instead of the one you guys are used to seeing. Um, scroll, scroll, scroll. Did I go too far? Okay, here we go. Okay. So the, the first part of the assignment is figuring out for each of ourselves what we want as a, you know, in, in our, in our lives or in our careers, 
you can refer to it a lot of different ways, but for this project, we'll call it, you know, success, right? Uh, how do you define success personally? Um, and you guys, I'm sure, have read this page, or if not, you can read it on your own. So I won't spend a lot of time. But the the project, this first assignment is kind of broken up into a couple of different stages. The first one is to read the selections that I pulled together for you guys to read that'll give you some background. And then as you read down here, we're gonna start taking some notes. Basically, these are mostly for you. I mean, I don't need long paragraphs or anything. What I want is just for you as you read to maybe write a sentence down that captures each of the points that the writer makes in each of the articles that I'm asking you to read, okay? So what are the main points? And what does each writer say career success is? Some of the articles are also about advice, meaning as we all try to figure out what success means to ourselves, what advice do these different writers provide about figuring that out? It might be a question that some of you guys have never even really thought much about before, you know? What, but I, I used, when I wrote this page up, I used, the, I used the analogy of somebody who gets in a car and has to go someplace. Well, if you don't have any particular direction or, or destination in mind, anywhere you end up is pretty much okay. <laughs> but, but that's not really the point of life, is it? We don't want to just end up anywhere. We want to end up someplace that we're really happy that we ended up there, right? So we have to kind of so that's the first piece is deciding for now, for this stage in our lives today, what do we think the goal's supposed to be? And, and what I learned in my life and what I think you guys are going to learn in your lives too, is that as you go through life and the different experiences that we all have change us and who we are a little bit at a time, that goal, that destination or what success is will change too okay but we but the thing is the day that you graduate is the day that they give you the keys to the car and they say okay bucko get going so you have to have some idea in mind of at least for today where do you think your destination is and and then so that's kind of the whole first two-thirds of the assignment right now and this assignment one is about one figuring out what those things might be and then the third piece is kind of brainstorming, sitting and having a think about, now that you've read all this stuff, what does it mean to you? What do you think at the end of the thing, at the end of this assignment is your destination or where do you wanna go, okay? This is a hard, hard question that a lot of people spend their lives wondering about. And so I don't know that you, the answer that you're going to come up with is going to be one that's going to be definitive for the rest of your lives. I, I hardly think it's going to be, but it'll be one that we can use as, as a get going place for this class project. Okay. So in, the, in step three, like I said, now that you've had some time to hear or read what other people have had to say about this important topic about what success, it's time for you to develop your own definition. So life's about change and what you come up with today does not have to be the definition that you stay with for life. I'm just reading to you now. Not even for the rest of the semester. If you guys want halfway through, you wanna rethink this a little bit because you're gonna to continue to whittle this down and polish this and work on it for the rest of the semester, right? But if other things that you learn change that perspective, then change your goal. But if they don't, continue to follow that through. And the project, this first assignment is about getting to know ourselves and what we think is important and what direction we think we want to point our cars as we drive forward into the sunset. Yeah. Okay. So what am I asking you guys to turn in? Well, nothing more than just maybe two to three type pages. Like what did you learn from what you read? What points stuck out to you as being most personally important? Like what I don't want to get back is so-and-so said this and so-and-so said that, and here's my nice summary. That's not the point. The point is 
you read all this stuff and then you put it away on the side and you sat down and you had yourself a nice time to think about it. And as you thought, you daydreamed and you wondered and you thought about you and what turns you on as a human. What finally do you think is your personal definition of success? What things do you want to see in your life? You think making so much money is a success or having a certain size family is a success or living in a particular neighborhood is a success or maybe it's some of that. And maybe for some of us, it's none of that. Like as much as I love hearing about Esmeralda's ranch and the nine horses and the 30 chickens, <laughs> I don't think personally that I would want to clean out nine horse stalls <laughs> every week to save my life. I, I, I wouldn't do that for a trillion dollars. <laughs> not, not my idea of a good time, <laughs> right? There's, there's just too much horse shit and all of that. <laughs> not into it, right? But, but, but look, we, we can all see Esmeralda right now with that big smile on her face. And you know, she loves this life that she's hacked out for herself here. This is her definition of success. So what I'm asking you guys to do is to read this stuff that I've given you and then try and hack out of that. What do you think, at least for now, is, is where do you want to end up in life? Do you guys get where I'm asking you to go? Okay. Got it. Yes, sir. Sweet. So as you scroll down the page and you see all of these article one, two, three, blah, 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 these are all links to the articles that I pulled out for you. And then back here under modules, let me just go back there again one more time. I also had one more, this modern perceptions of career success.pdf. Now this thing here is a real brain teaser. I mean, th th this is not an easy article to read, but I thought it was a really good one. So I'm gonna kind of challenge you guys to work through it, okay? Um, and, and so I'm, why am I giving you that as an upfront? I'm giving it to you as an upfront because I want you guys to leave enough time to actually hack through it. It's only about five pages, but it's one of those five pages that's got two columns of text per page. So there's a lot on every page. And, and it was written in kind of an academic way. So it's a little bit in an elevated writing style. And it may not be something that you're used to reading. So leave yourself some time and maybe have alongside yourselves a dictionary if you need it. But there's really good stuff there to think about once you, once, once you unravel the Gordian knot. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yes? Yes. OK. So, so that's the assignment for the week. And I wanted to start there because it'll be due um, on the 13th, which is um, a week from last night. And I'll go back again to the modules page. And if you notice, there's this thing here up, wh whoops, I lost it. One, two, three, um, under the class project. Wait, 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 wait for it. Here it is, um, uploads class project assignments. When you click on this, It's going to take you to a folder that I created in Dropbox. Okay. So you're just going to click on add files, find your file and upload it. Next best thing to actually being in a classroom and handing it to me, right? Yes. Pretty simple. Yeah. Okay. So that's what we're, that's what we're shooting for. Okay. Uh, excuse me for being so casual tonight with you guys sitting here on my couch. I, uh, I had a, a little procedure today at the doctor's office and I'm a little winded, but uh, we'll have a good time tonight. Okay, let me open up our chapters. Let me see. Um, I just uh, Professor, I have a question. For... Fire away, Arlen. What's up? Um, so for the documents, so for the project that we have, is it gonna, do we make it in an essay format? Um, I don't need you to do it in an essay format. In fact, it, when you read closely that thing we just went over, 
you're going to see that for the summary of what the writers wrote about, mm -hmm. it's mostly for you. So that when you go back later on to write your paper that you're going to write, you're going to have all this as all the back work that you've already done. So what I'm asking you to do is as you read those articles, write bullet points. Like once, like if the guy makes a whole paragraph out of saying basically one thing, write a sentence that summarizes the paragraph. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Like you were taking notes in one of my lectures, okay? I, mm -hmm. I, don't, I, don't, I don't want this part of the assignment to be a lot of work. Mm -hmm. What I'm really interested in this project for the whole class is for you guys to think your way through what I'm trying to lead you through. I'm interested in how you think about it. I don't want to know what somebody else said. I want to know how what you just read strikes you. Oh, it, so, what, oh, so we're summarizing the pair. So we're summarizing the articles and we write them in our words and that could be up to two to three pages. It, I'm not asking you to summarize the articles. I'm asking you to simply understand what these people have said and maybe mm -hmm. put that down in bullet points. And then as the next step to it, I would like to see something more formal written from you that says, okay, based on what I read, this is the stuff that's really important to me. And as I think about my life, the things that I think I'm, that are gonna be, you know, I'm going to feel that I'm a successful person. I'm gonna feel like I'm a successful professional if during my lifetime, I achieve these certain things. So I'm kind of, what I'm trying to do is give you a background for what other people have said success is all about and then use that as, as um, as as background for you to say, well, okay, that's what all these other people are saying, but how do I personally feel about that? What uh, I want to what I want to know all about is what do you think success is all about? But based on what all these other people have already said, so that you've got something to filter your thinking through. Oh, okay. Does that make sense? Yeah, it kind of makes sense. It makes it kind sense. of kind of makes sense. So it doesn't totally make sense. Like, how is it gonna be? Like, okay, so the bullet points. So we make it in a document or something like. Or we make it into. A I, yeah, what? Right. So I'm looking for two to three pages. If a page and a half of it, are or whatever it takes you to do, is just you know bullet points about what you learned in the other articles i don't need you to write essays i don't need you to string it all out and make it all elegant i all i want for the summary part is really summary fashion bullet points but when it, when it comes down to the most important piece of what i'm asking you to do that part i want you to write as well as you can the part that okay. says all about arlen what do you okay. think? that part i'd like to see written as well as you can write it Okay, so you make bullet points for the articles and then we do that. Yes, yes. Okay. Does that clarify? Yeah, that clarifies it. I'm like, oh, do I have to write in an essay format or something like no, that? No, no, not, not the whole thing. I just want to see, I want to see your thoughts written out as detailed and as completely and well thought out and well written as you can do it when it comes to you. When it comes to what everybody else says, summarize it for me. Okay. And now I'm, asking, I'm asking you to take those notes and make those bullet points just so that as you're reading it, you're really paying attention to what those other people are saying. And so that you can follow it and somehow put it in your own head in an organized way. Okay. Okay. Now I'm getting it. Okay. Okay. I, I yeah. Okay. Anybody else have a question about what I'm looking for? That's a, those are good questions. That's really good, Arlen. Thanks for getting that started. How about the rest of you guys? No, I think Everything I got it. clear. Yeah? Okay, good. I, I really think this is a really valuable process, guys. I tell you, when I was in college, I spent until somewhere during my junior year undeclared. <laughs> I didn't have a major yet. And I didn't really know why I was there. And, and then I did graduate with a degree in business. But even after I graduated and I went to work, I still really didn't know why I was doing what I was doing. Does that sound familiar to anybody at all? 
but you're kind of just yes. going through life going, <laughs> I don't know why I'm here. I'm just doing it because somehow I got on the path and shit, 10 years later, here I am still. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. So, so, so the idea with this is to try and help as many students as I can avoid that. Because that leads you to a disappointing place. You don't want to go there. Yeah. Or um, there's a song I really like. You guys know who George Harrison was, right? He used to be in the Beatles a long time ago. He had this great song that he wrote. And in it, there was a line that said, if you don't know where you're going, any road will take you there. So true. Right? So true. Didn't he also say in an interview that he was happy that he got kicked out of the Beatles? Well, he, he, got didn't, to, he didn't really get kicked out of the leave? Beatles. I'm not, yeah, he left for a while. Yeah. Well, they were having horror. We could talk about that all day. I love <laughs> you guys. But, um, but anyway, um, yeah. Uh, the, the point is, I want you guys, as we go through this course, to have, you have to do some writing and some presenting anyway. I wanted to come up with an assignment that you guys could feel was personally valuable for your time and your lives to do it in the first place. And maybe to give you a head start on something that took me until I was in my 40s to figure out. Okay. Yeah, definitely. Sweet. Okay, good. Let me um, let me get back around to where I'm supposed to be here with uh, uh, let's see. Okay. I'm gonna open up chapter three. Am I still sharing my screen? Yes. Good, okay. Then I gotta make uh, this part kind of small again. I got the gallery nice and big so I can see all you guys, but then I can't see anything else. Okay, let's see, how do I get rid of this? Okay. Not there. Cool. Whoops. Sorry for the delay here. Okay, so a little, little bit of review, right? Last week we talked about this three by three process of writing, didn't we? We're gonna come back tonight and talk about the organizing and the drafting piece. Now, what you're gonna notice about this week's class project assignment is that we're basically doing the organizing and the drafting this week. And, and we're thinking a little bit about the audience too, right? Um, organizing and drafting, what does this mean and how do we do it? And, and you'll understand what I said about what this homework assignment is about this week too and how this chapter and this assignment dovetail, but we'll get to that. So last week, you'll remember this, right? We've talked about this three by three writing process. Yes. Okay. So we said that there is the rewrite, the pre-writing, which is analyzing the audience and the purpose just as a review, anticipating the audience and the reaction to the message and adapting the message to the audience. Well, when you guys are thinking about this particular project for the class, we have got a couple of different audiences. You've got a primary audience and you've got a secondary. Remember we used those terms last week too, primary audience, secondary audience. Yes. Who can somebody remind me what the primary audience is? Uh, the primary audience is who you're intending your message to go to directly. That's right. Uh, yeah. So for the sake of this class project, who do you think the audience really is? Myself. Yeah, that's exactly right. That's exactly you're doing this for you. The most important reader of this thing is going to be you. Because you're the one that stands to gain the most from the information that you're going to figure out. The yeah. secondary audience is anybody else that you care to share it with, okay? The drafting uh, um, piece is mostly what we're working on this week. And it includes the research background and information collection. And I've already given you guys a head start. 
if you guys work along through what I've selected for you to read and you find, you know, this is kind of getting to it, but I really want more. I don't know that I really have enough here yet. I feel like I need to learn some more. Please dive away, right? Google search is the greatest tool since sliced bread, right? Mm -hmm. Then you're going to organize your info. So as we talked about, I'm asking you guys to, in, in this case, organizing the info would be, there's two halves to it. There's what everybody else has already said. That's part of what you've got. And then there's the other part about what do you personally think about the question, what defines success? Okay. So you could, you're going to basically organize this assignment into those two fields organize you know what does everybody else say and what's most important to you then you're going to come up with a draft last week we said okay look if we have pre-writing and drafting and then the third piece which is you know corrections and edits and rewrites and all that and you were to look at a pie chart that divided all of your time how much of our time did we say gets spent in the edits and proofs and final drafting phase? The revising phase, that would yeah. be 50%. 50%, not, you knocked it on the head, way to go, Arlen. Okay, so revising, editing for clarity. So when you asked the question a few minutes ago, Arlen, about you know, what part are you supposed to write really formally and like in an essay format or something. I said, the part that's about you. And the reason that I think that that's true and so important is because in order for you to have a clear idea in your mind, you have to be able to explain it to somebody else so they can understand it too. A lot of times it's in the working out of the details in getting the language right, that we begin to think about maybe there's problems in the logic that we're using. So if you sit down and write it really carefully, it's going to force you to really think through some of those issues. Okay. The other stuff, the stuff that's background, that's the stuff that is informing what your own thoughts really should be or are going to be. That stuff is not as important. It's mostly done for your own homework. And so bullets are fine for that. But when you really need to be clear and concise and well understood, that's a huge piece of revising. So you spend a lot of time in that clarity piece. Proofreading. Again, if you get your document to the point where you wrote everything out and it's great English and it's well punctuated and there's no mistakes in it. It's because you've thought through the details really carefully. You guys are all in college now, which means that you've already had at least 12 years of how do you write a sentence and how do you write a paragraph? Okay. So now you're looking for all the mistakes. And remember last week I said, when you're proofreading, make a game out of it. And the game should be, the person who finds the most mistakes the first time around wins, okay? You wanna find every single mistake under the sun. And, and I think a lot of times when we're finding errors, we feel bad about ourselves or like we're not real bright. Oh, I, there I made another mistake. And, we don't, and so we don't do as good a job of proofreading it because we don't want to see our own errors. But you know what, if you make it fun, and you say the whole point of this exercise is to find those errors so that you can correct them so that somebody else doesn't have to see them, then you've done a great job in revision. And then evaluating whether the message accomplishes the goals. Well, in this case, with what you're gonna do this week, you've accomplished the goal. If to your own personal satisfaction, you've really explained for what you think defines success. At least, like I keep saying, at least for this moment in time. Okay? Y'all with me? Yes. yes. Right on. Okay. Definitely. Sweet. So we're going to apply that. We looked at this, applying the two by three writing process. 
Did we do some homework, some formal and informal research? So again, you guys doing the reading of the articles that I selected for you this time around is you guys doing what they call secondary research. When you read things that other people have written to, to um, inform your own work, you're doing what they call secondary research. The stuff was not originally pulled together so that it would be used in your paper. It was originally written for some other purpose. But the fact that it's there and is useful to you makes your whole research job a lot faster and a lot easier. So that's why people like to use secondary data, okay? Then you're gonna group it. Like I said, there's at least two ways to group this, what other people said and what you think. You're gonna outline it. You'll choose a communication strategy. Like last week, again, just to quickly review, we looked at, there's lots of different times of business when we communicate with people and you want to match up the appropriate or best way to communicate it with the kind of message it is that you have to share. So, so an assignment like the one that we're doing this week together is one that probably, you, you could turn it in in a lot of ways. You could do a video. You could all send me singing telegram people to sing me your presentation, but that would be totally the wrong way to do it. Probably the best way to do it, we've decided is a two to three page small little paper, okay? And you'll produce that first draft, which is your rough draft. And by the end of this whole steps one through five, you've done 50% of it and the final draft is the other half. So let's talk about informal research methods for a minute. Well, informal research means that it's already been done before. We don't worry about how statistically relevant is my sample size. We don't worry about, you know, um, how dated is the information or not. We don't worry about was this information captured for exactly the purpose I'm intending to use it for. We don't worry about that. We just say, what is the most convenient information for me to get my hands around and still get the job done? So you could use company files, for instance. Or you could sit down in a work setting and you could talk with the boss. Or you could do a formal or an informal survey. Let's say that you wanted to go out, we, let's say that we were all on campus this semester and um, you had to measure the opinions of a hundred people about the food in the cafeteria. Well, you could go into the cafeteria where everybody is seated all in one spot and they're already eating the food there and you could measure it that way. Or you could say, I'd rather have a more random sample. So you're gonna take a few surveys in all your different classrooms, maybe get some people out in the parking lot, maybe some people out in the quad, whatever you have, and get your 100 answers that way. Lots of different ways you could do it. Some are informal and some are not. Or you're gonna sit down and brainstorm for ideas, like I said, that part that's about you in this week's class project assignment is the brainstorming for ideas. You've already heard what a bunch of other people think. Now it's time to sit down and think about, okay, you know you better than anyone else knows you. You know what you want, you know what you need, you know what you like, you know what the kind of things you need to feel safe and happy and secure, all the things that might impact success. And as you think through those, you're coming up with a list of what those things are. And that whole brain dump process is brainstorming, okay? So we can look at formal research methods too. So we just looked at informal and then there's some formal ones. So when it comes to formal ones, we could look at, do I go online? Look, when I came up with those lists of seven articles or eight that I came up with for you, I just did a Google search and I found some ones that I thought were interesting and might help you. That's an electronic search. That's an internet. That's a Google search. Or you could go into the library. Like, you know, when I was in college, you know, I graduated in 1989. So back in the stone age, when we used to 
take these clay tablets and chisel out our words with a knife, you know? Um, I would have gone into the library and climbed the seven stories of the library at Cal State Fullerton, and I would have found the books and whoosh, blown the dust off of them and all that, and I would have done it manually. It would have been a lot harder. Investigating the primary sources, okay? So if what I'm interested in is a survey among top management members on campus, talk to the deans of the different departments, talk to, you know, the dean of the, of the college in general, you know, talk to, you know, some teachers on campus, whatever, and get their opinions about something, I would be a student going to primary sources about something that's happening at Fullerton College. Or if I was going to do a scientific experiment, so let's say that, let's say we've got a situation. Let's say that the people that run the food program in the cafeteria are thinking about raising the price on the pizza, but they don't know exactly how much to raise it by. They know that if they go too high, a lot of customers that buy the pizza all the time are gonna just walk away and not buy lunch on campus anymore. Well, they don't wanna go that high. On the other hand, they know that they don't want to leave money on the table either, right? The point of that, of that price increase that they're taking is to offset increases that they have in their costs. So they can't charge too little or they're going to lose money on the pizza. So the question is, how high can we go before we've gone too far? If you guys were going to do an experiment like that, can you think of any ways you might set it up? Any suggestions? I guess you could conduct another survey as far as making suggestions um, for prices. Okay. What would the question what would the question on the survey look like? What would it sound like? Would you purchase a slice of pizza for two dollars, five dollars, or seven dollars? Yeah, okay. And and so if you get lots and lots and lots of answers around two bucks you know for sure that $2 is probably going to be a price that everybody can afford. But exactly. you know, but you've only but you've already been at a buck 75 and you know your costs are going up. So so you need to push it beyond customers are always going to tell you to charge them as little as possible, right? True. So that doesn't necessarily show us how far we can push it. So if I was going to do an experiment about this, if the last day on Friday of a particular week, the pizza was a buck 75, and on Monday when the kids came to school and they were gonna go buy the pizza in the cafeteria, and the price was all of a sudden 275, and at the end of the day, they had half of the pizza that they had cooked had to be thrown away, what would that tell them? The price is too high. Right, so you know that you wanna be someplace above a buck 75, but below 275. And so what you would probably think was, okay, I'm gonna successively lower my price off that 275 until, I, until what? Until we generate the most amount of profit off that pizza as we can. So every week they're gonna be doing the numbers. How much pizza did we sell? At what price point? What was our cost for the pizza? Minus, you know, and what was our revenue? And when they get to that profit maximizing point, maybe it wasn't two bucks, maybe it was 227. I don't know, I'm just throwing it out there. But that was the number that people would support where they actually maximize their profits. We got there by experimentation. We were learning all the time. We were taking notes about what we were finding out. And we got to that point by trial and error and then we said, okay, let's run it for one more week. Let's say that on Monday, we're gonna come back in and, and um, sell it at that 227 mark. And they did that following Monday, they put it out there at 227 and they sold it out every last bit. It told them that they didn't really lose any business at that price point. People still found it to be a relative value. Maybe it wasn't as cheap as it used to be, but it didn't ever need to be that cheap in the first place. 
They got to 227. That was the best price point, and they proved it. They didn't just get there once and by accident. It seems like that's the right number. They went back and they tried it again, and they got the very same results. And as they did that week after week at 227, they always got those great results. They knew for sure that they had that winning number at 227. Makes sense. Okay. So that would be in business how we conduct experiments. So that would be a formal research model. Okay. That's, by the way, that's exactly the same way that we would do that if we were in a chem lab mixing up chemicals in a beaker. At what point did the thing turn from green to blue? Well, it was exactly when I put that last drop of that one chemical in the beaker. It had been green, 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 all the way until I put that last drop and it changed the color. And that tells you that that's the amount of that chemical you need, or at least the ratio between the two chemicals that you need in order to always get blue. And we do the same, and that's what they call a before and after test with an observation in the middle. The observation is we made the most amount of profit or the observation was we uh, turned it blue at exactly that point and only that point. You see how the two things are really the same? Yes. Okay. So we've done, so there's informal and there's formal ways of learning things. And then we take that information that we've been bundling together for our document, our communication, and we're gonna organize it in some pattern that's going to make sense, right? And, you know, depending on everyone's, um, depending on a few things, the needs of your audience, you've already heard, and the way you think your audience is gonna to respond to the information, but also, you know, according to your own writing style, because we're all a little bit different, those are the three things that are going to combine together, you know, and, and, and develop the organization of your document. So, for instance, we can group ideas that are similar together. Let's say that you were writing a paper about modes of transportation in Orange County, California, and you were going to write on two or three different points but the same points across all of these different modes of transportation. Well, what are the different ways that in Southern California, people get around? Can you guys help me with this? What are the modes of transportation in OC? Personal vehicles. Okay. Bus. Transit. Yeah. Train. Bikes. Sure. Yeah. Bicycles, right? Skate. Getting in strangers' cars <laughs> and then paying them. Uber. Yeah, yeah Uber. <laughs> Yeah. Stranger danger. Stranger danger. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, if you're super wealthy, maybe you've got a helicopter and a helipad in your parents' backyard. I don't know. Private jet, yo. Private jet. <laughs> okay. So, whoops, I didn't mean to go there. So, we're going to, maybe your points are you want to talk about fuel efficiency and you want to talk about, um, uh, um, you know, um, greenhouse gas emissions. And you want to talk about um, uh, parking availability? Maybe those are the three things. And so you want to come. You want to compare, you know, fuel efficiency and greenhouse and um, you know, parking across buses and uh, Lyft and Uber and bicycles and personal transportation and whatever. But you talk. But so it would make the most sense to talk about it in terms of modes of transportation or well, what could be another way to do it? Well, you could probably go about thinking about it in terms of, okay, I'm gonna talk first about fuel efficiency. And within my section in the paper about fuel efficiency, I will talk about buses and Uber and um, you know personal vehicles and bicycles. You could do it that way too, right? So it, it all depends on what focus or what, what uh, um, you want your dominant message to be. It, again, it has a lot to do with 
who your audience is and what you're really trying to emphasize. But the whole idea is grouping things into similar arrangements so that it's easy for your audience to follow it. That's one. Now we can organize our information into lists or outlines. So for instance, I told you guys that for the sake of the background information in the first assignment, when it comes to what other people wrote about, give me a list of bullets. But some of you guys, some of you really overachievers might go, you know what? I found that even in what I read between the articles, there seemed to be three or four different themes that were in common across all those articles. So maybe what you'll do is you'll arrange your bullets by those themes. You might have four themes and under each theme, several bullets. It's another way to organize the information. So in your mind, what you should be thinking about is what's the clearest way for me to present it? So it's not just a jumble of information. Just a big mush. Yeah, not just a big mush. And also what's gonna be for you, the person who's gonna at the end of this have to write a, a paper about your career search, you know, what is gonna be the best way for you to learn the information and save the information so that when it comes time to compile your final document, you've got something that's really workable. So you always kind of want to be thinking a few steps ahead of yourself. And if you just think about the thing that's right here in front of you right now and forget about what's out there in the future, you're going to limit your options. You're kind of working yourself into a corner, which you don't want to do. So if you leave things more broad, arranging by themes and then putting you know, bullets under themes, that might put you in a better communication position and a better organization just for you as a communicator down the road so it's a little bit about strategy too right yeah so for example i think that if i um i were to set this up right now that same paper and with this um how to organize it um i think i would set it up in the definition of well how would i define success and and in bullets as far as like well relating to money relating to education relating to family and home excellent and then from that would be the possible ways i could organize it right because down the road when you're thinking about you know a future step in this project about what are your values yes and you and you come up with well you know a happy a, a, a happy you know, safe, secure family is an important value for you, then you know that, you know, there were all these things about family that you learned about in the prior assignment that you can easily get your hands around and boom, drop it right into this new basket. Yes. Is this making sense for all you guys? Yes. Yeah, okay, yes. good. All right, so let's talk about outlining, efficiently outlining something, right? We, when we write, let's say, remember back in, in high school or maybe it was even junior high, you guys, for me, junior high was in the late 1970s. So <laughs> I, I can barely remember that far back, but I know that they taught me, for instance, that when I was gonna write an essay, I started off with, a, a thesis statement, right? It was sort of like the topic sentence in a paragraph, but it's the thesis statement. It's the, it's the umbrella that's gonna kind of organize everything that's to come, yeah? And that would be your topic. So if you're gonna outline, the, the most broad place you can start in an outline would be your topic, right? This is going to be about modes of transportation in Orange County. Yeah. And then underneath that topic, you might say, OK, we know that the predominant modes of transportation are mass transit, including buses and trains or buses and light rail, personal transportation and um, Lyft and Uber. OK, those are the three types, just whatever they are. So that would be what these three cubes emphasize. Right. you got your 
broad thing, transportation, and then you've got your next lower down level in you know terms of generality, which are the three modes. And then what you see in this next thing here would be taking one of those little cubes Let's say that one cube is about mass transit, so buses and light rail. And what are your points that you have to make about mass transit in Orange County? And then one step below that would be, what is the most important statement you have to make about mass transit in Orange County? So, so think about how this starts off really, really broad and then as you develop your paper, it's getting narrower and narrower and narrower until it, until it arrives at something very, very, very specific. So in another sense, this is a great way to think about if you're trying to um, lead somebody, like in a business situation, you're there in a room with a bunch of fellow managers and you're trying to lead them into making the decision that you, the manager on the project, at your core think is the best decision that should be made right now, this is a great approach for that. You're gonna start off really broad and you're gonna feed them information that gets more and more specific and more and more pointed until there's no place else for them logically to go except to accept your recommendation because you've led them there. Are you with me? Yes. Yes. So years ago, and I, I always think about this, years ago, I saw this really brilliant documentary about two guys, mountain guides living in the Himalayas, right, in, in uh, Nepal. Um, and um, these are the highest mountains in the world. This is K2 and Mount Everest. I mean, people don't climb these mountains except for if they're super, super awesome athletes and have trained all their lives to do it. This is not your, you know, typical Saturday afternoon hike, right? But these two guys, and they call these mountain guides, the formal word for that is a Sherpa. They, these two Sherpas had it in their mind that they wanted to lead a classroom full of blind, completely blind school children to the top of Mount Everest. True story. It doesn't sound like they achieved this. Oh, no, they did. Oh, wow. They did. Now, when you guys think about this thing about climbing Everest, they have things called a crevasse, right? Which is basically this gaping, big, huge gap. I mean, it could be thousands of feet down to the bottom of a gap on the trail. And it's completely filled in with snow so that from the top of the thing where you are, you don't know that it's nothing but powder between you and the free fall below you. Wow. So whenever they come to places like this, they take these aluminum ladders, like these 16, 20 foot long ladders that they're actually climbing this mountain with and they stretch them across the snow from one piece of ground that's totally solid and they know that's rock underneath them to another over there. And then these guys shimmy out there on this ladder, holding on to the rungs and crawling across it. Can you imagine asking 60, 70 blind school children to do that? Wow. Now, how do you suppose they were able to get these kids to the top and back down to the bottom again? No one got hurt. A helicopter? <laughs> Good guess. Was it a lot of communicating? Yeah. By really, really specific communication that starts off very broad. Okay, my next guess was going to be they're tied to each other. <laughs> well, <laughs> that could work for you or against you, you know. <laughs> One falls, ah, they all fall. <laughs> now, the way that they do this is at the beginning, they say, here's our broad topic sentence. We are going to climb Mount Everest. Okay. <laughs> now we have three different main paths we could go up. 
it's the one cube path or the middle cube path or the leather cube path on the far right over there. Okay. Now we're in the middle of the middle cube path. Now you guys, I need you to walk very carefully and do exactly as I told you. And we're only thinking about this tiny little stretch of the really, really super long trail that we're gonna be on. You know, Everest is not a thing that you do in a day, right? Yeah. It's a, it, most people do Everest over a period of a couple of months. Yep. Like it takes, like you get to base camp and you basically acclimatize for three or more weeks, just getting used to the elevation. Wow. Okay. So, so you like camp there? So, so you camp there, which is why they have Sherpas, because mostly the people that do this trek are, are loaded with money and they have these Sherpas to carry all their stuff for them. <laughs> so when these rich as hell guys get to base camp, they just kick it for a few weeks and let the Sherpas do all the work. Wow. This is this is this is no sport for for you know people who are broke like you and me, right? <laughs> or or me. <laughs> yeah, right. So yeah, I'm telling you. Um, so the the big um, the big light bulb moment there, right? The pinnacle of everything that they've done to achieve the big statement at the end is we're at the top. And oh, by the way, we need to turn around and get going back down in a half an hour or we'll freeze to death up here tonight. <laughs> it's, it's, but you should read a book called um, uh, Into Thin Air. Oh my gosh. Kick ass book. It's written by a guy named John Krakauer. K R A K A U E R. This is, a re this is a true life story about two expeditions that went up the mountain at the same time. One of the teams turned around at the right time and the other team didn't. And it's all about what happened to these people. It is the most gut-wrenching, awe-inspiring, scare the shit out of you story that you'd ever imagined. Wow. You should That's definitely, cool. definitely check this book out. Into, Into Thin Air? Into Thin Air, John Krakauer. Cool. Anyway. What I'm trying to tell you is that this example that I've just given you for writing your paper and outlining something is the Sherpa and the blind school children's expedition story. You have to lead your reader very, very carefully through your document or, you're, or they're gonna fall off the trail and get lost someplace. You have to lead them. And when it's, and when it's something like a, like a sales presentation, and you know that either you're gonna you know, make your bonus for the year or not, then you know that this is your customer. You need to lead them very, very carefully through each one of these important phases in the pitch, or you're not gonna make your sale. Or if this is an argument or a, you, know, you asking your mom and dad, if you can take out the Mercedes Benz, because you got a hot date Friday night and your dad won't even let you wash the car, this is how you form your argument. Am I making sense to you? Yeah. All right. I'm gonna use it on a part, on a Halloween party. <laughs> Good. I hope it works for you. So the main topic, divide the main topic into three or five, three to five major components. Break each one of those down into exclusive subpoints. Use the details, the illustrations, the evidence in the subpoints to make your conclusion. Now, in business, you guys are one day going to learn something else. You're going to learn that information is power. If you have the facts and you're the one in the room that's leading the presentation, you know it better than anyone else in that room knows it. You're in control of that meeting. You're in control of the way that decision is made. But you have to assemble your argument, your presentation in such a way that nobody can argue the facts. Facts are gonna win nine times out of nine. Information is power. 
Does this make sense? Absolutely. So this is the same idea. What I'm trying to tell you is that this lesson that I'm teaching you right now applies in a hundred different places throughout your life. As long as you think about it like this, the very general to the exquisitely in, um, uh, minute, the smallest detail. Okay, so we start thinking about our audience, right? In this pre-writing phase. And you're gonna come up with a presentation about what are the pieces in here, in this section in here gonna look like? And it's all based on, well, what does your audience need to hear in order for you to be the most effective? Most effective is gonna be most convincing. Okay. So, well, one is how are they gonna respond? So last week I told you that if they're going to, if you anticipate that they're either going to be neutral or positive along this, you know, this, this measure here like this to neutral to, or actually neutral to positive like that, then you're going to assemble it a certain way. But if it's going to go the other way where this is neutral and this is really negative, anywhere between here is going negative, then you're going to create your strategy in another way. So it's all about what do you, how well do you know your audience? And how well do you know, not just the people and the way they think, but the kinds of information they need to hear you spin out to convince them? Like this measure here. So if they're pleased, somewhat interested, or neutral, you're going to take what they call an indirect, I'm sorry, a direct strategy. Pleased to neutral, that range direct strategy. Indirect, kind of backing into it slowly, selling yourself into them and selling your audience into it, is if you think they're either going to be ah oh, pretty blah, I don't care, you know, what time can we leave the meeting to? I hate this all the way down there to hostile. Okay, if that's the if when I talk about the direct strategy, you already think that you've already got them on your side. So what you're going to say is, look. I want to tell you guys why I think such and such a decision is the best one to be made. This, you don't think you're going to ruffle any feathers here. In fact, most people you're assuming, or you've not just assuming, you've got a pretty good idea, but most people already agree with you. But if you're over here where you think that they're really not going to like your recommendation at the end, then you're going to do this. You're going to start off by saying, I want to talk to you guys about this general discussion today. And then as you feed them the information selectively, leading them down that nice narrow path towards where you want them to go, kicking and screaming probably on their side of the table, but you're not leaving them any outs because they can't argue with anything that you've come up with to share with them yet. And when everything points in a certain direction, as much as they don't like it, they're gonna feel like there's nowhere to go except for what he's telling us. I think a great example of this could be contentious with you guys right now. Esmeralda, I'm particularly interested in how you'd feel about this. But I think that Biden, a couple of weeks ago, when he said, we're leaving today, he already knew what was gonna happen. He knew it was gonna be a shitstorm. But he was also realizing that, you know what, that knucklehead Trump already took away most of my men. And this is already guaranteed to the freaking Taliban to begin with. And I really don't have any other cards to play. And I personally think that he knew that the Republicans and, you know, Fox News were going to give him a raft of you know what for doing it. But he also knew there wasn't anywhere else to go. And so he just moved. That's how I see it. And I think he did the right thing. Now, now you guys. Yeah, that, I, think, that, I think it's a good, I think it's a good analogy. Yeah, that, I mean, it, yeah, you're going to compare it to, to um, setting this up and how to, how to give those news and everything. But yeah that's a very very hard topic <laughs> incredibly hard and yeah. uh, i'll tell you what it, it's 
uh, as a vet, as, especially a, an Afghanistan vet. Yeah. And um, having all my fellow Afghanistan vets, we literally just met. And this has been really rough, really, really rough. I bet. Um, why Biden chose to do it that way? Who the hell knows? I'd like to know. <laughs> yeah. I would love to know the background information. But um, I think he was set up. I think he inherited a big stinky turd from the guy before him. Yeah, I, I don't know. It, it's hard to say uh, to be uh, it, for having been in that in this position and, and seeing how the things work. It, there's always another option. There's always another option. So. OK, I would love to have this conversation with you sometime. Really. <laughs> yeah, yeah. 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 So anyways, cool. All right. So, but you, but you get at least the analogy that I'm trying to give you, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. So, like, yeah, it's just the bad news, and sometimes, um, well, in this case, uh, he had, there was no choice and go direct. But um, if you're gonna give bad news, take a indirect route. <laughs> <laughs> well, the indirect route could have been. To, to break it on us a little bit at a time and you say we're, we're going to do a we're going to do a partial withdrawal i've only got 2500 guys on the ground right now i'm going to leave a thousand of them and i'll come back for those thousand later with that a bit with that but then they would then he would have been left shorthanded right and what would have happened to those thousand guys yeah it, it's definitely um and was he supposed to amp was he supposed to to escalate again when in time that you know we all want to get out well yeah that, that was the issues that they set up a, a date um to just get out and just get out yeah planning in phases which is typically more like what, how you do it mm -hmm. yeah so you do it in phases and so you can set everybody up for success right now, would you say it's a success in the end if we got 120,000 or whatever it was out of there? Uh, with the collateral damage being unnecessary, no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, like all the all the surrendered weapons that the Taliban now have at their disposal. Exactly. Yeah, that's a that's a mess. Well, anyway, let's go on. This could we could talk this all night. Oh yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So you're going to compose your first draft, right? We want to look at sentence types, variety of sentences, because if everything goes subject, verb, object, subject, verb, object, they're all real simple sentences. This is going to be the most boring paper on earth. No one wants, is going to want to read through that. On the other hand, you also want to avoid sentence fragments or other types of grammatical errors. So let's look more closely at what we mean by all that. There's four kinds of sentences that we can write in. The first one is called a simple sentence. Okay, that's a sentence where you've got just one independent clause. She needs job, right? Subject is who's the subject in this sentence? She. Who's the what is the verb? Needs. Yep. And what's the object? A job. Yep. She needs a job. Perfectly fine sentence all by itself, but I wouldn't want to string a whole bunch of these together and call it a finished paper. Now we could look at two um, independent clauses that are strung together with some sort of a linkage. I could have something like, she needs a job and I need a hamburger. <laughs> <laughs> She needs a job and she must expand her skill set. In both cases, she is a subject. Expand or need is the verb. Job and skill set is the object. So basically, I've got two number ones strung together to make a number two. Yeah? Get it done my way. All right. Now let's go down 
a little bit more complex. I've got a complex clause and I've got an, or I've got a, I'm sorry, I've got an independent clause and I've got a dependent clause. If it's independent, like she needs a job, it means it can stand by itself, right? Like, you know, when, you know, students who finally get to move out of mom and dad's house are now living on their own, they're said to be independent, okay? Now you're dependent if you think that you're really living on your own, but mom and dad are still paying all the bills even though you're not living in their house anymore. Are you really independent yet? Yeah, no. 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 Now my daughter Lauren thinks that she's independent, but we're paying her bills, okay? So, <laughs> <laughs> so this is a conversation we keep having, okay? <laughs> all right. So in a complex sentence, I've got an Esmeralda and I've got my daughter Lauren hooked together with some sort of a linkage thing here, right? And here's what that looks like. Because she needs a job, if you put your hand over the end of that sentence and all you look at is because she needs a job, does that, is that all by itself in a, on a piece of paper, would that be a complete sentence because she needs a job? Mm-mm. Mm-mm. She must expand her skill set, definitely is, right? But I can use them together as a complex sentence. And all I had to do is add a comma in between the two. And it makes it totally fine. Now, the most complicated kind of sentence that we can write is what we call a compound complex. So it's two independent clauses and one dependent clause looks like this first of all you guys which one is the uh dependent clause in this one also must begin networking she, she also must begin it's 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 the 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 dependent one. Oh, okay. which one is which job? one is dependent because she needs a job yes all right, now which is the first of the two independent? She must expand her scope. Yes. And then the other one would be she also must begin networking. That she, the word she through networking is totally fine as a sentence all by itself. I have this linking word here in between, this word however. Think about two trains on a track that are linked with a coupler in the middle. Or like the, like the tractor trailer on a semi truck and the trailer that the tractor is pulling, right? I've got an independent, the tractor part in the front and the dependent, the trailer that can't go anywhere because it doesn't have an engine. Mm -hmm. And I got that coupler in the middle, the word however. Okay. Now, so, so when we write, we wanna write using a combination of all of these, the simple, the compound, the complex, and a compound complex. When you, when you mix a variety of these together, the, the, the and, well, first of all, for the reader, the enjoyment level of reading that goes way up because it's, it's not so redundant sounding throughout the whole thing, okay? And you as a writer get to write much more interesting thoughts too in a more complex kind of a way. It is gonna make your writing a whole lot better by having a variety in there. Now, three common sentence faults. What are the three kinds of mistakes that we tend to see a lot? One, fragments which is like, it's a part of a sentence, but it's not the complete thing. So we've already looked at sentence fragments. Because she needs a job, we called that a dependent clause, and it is, but it's also a sentence fragment. Because it, it's not a complete sentence. So email seems boring. Email is a subject, seems is the verb, Boring is sort of an adjective that, right? 
when compared with Twitter, now I got two pieces here. Email seems boring. That's a sentence that can stand all by itself, which basically would be the same thing as it is. Email seems. It is, believe it or not, is actually fine as a sentence. This word boring is more of a adjective defining the way the thing seems or the way the thing is, okay? Now, when you look at when compared with Twitter, is that a full sentence? Uh, no. No. What would you call that? A uh, fragment. Yep. Nice. I can revise it. Email seems boring when compared with Twitter. Now, I haven't changed the thing except for what? The period. The punctuation, the period. And the capitalization, yeah. right? The capital W versus lowercase w in yeah. when? So that's, so it's, it's all about, and again, you know, you guys would have recognized this immediately, but I could have shown you examples that would have been more complicated to recognize. When you guys read a lot, you'll start to immediately see this because it's sort of like, what looks wrong with this page? What does not look like things that I've read before? Now, avoid run-ons. Run-ons is when I have two independent clauses with no joining word in, in between. Like I had that here in my number two sentence, the compound sentence. It was two independent clauses. She needs a job. She must expand her skill set but I have this word and in the middle. So I don't, so it's not two run on sentences. Whereas over here, he's addicted to social media. He posts updates constantly. This is a run on. Cause I don't have that joining word in between. In the second, in the second example here, do you see where they've added the joining word in, in, in there? And comma, comma and. yeah, comma and yeah. Or I could have done it this way just to throw you up a little bit. He's addicted to social media, it's running exactly the same as the first two examples. The other way to do it instead of comma and would be a semicolon. He posts updates constantly. So Either one of these two styles, revision in the middle and revision at the bottom, either one of these is fine, just depending on the style of writing you want to use. Hmm. Questions about that? No. Okay. Do you guys need a break? How are we doing for on your side? Good. I'm doing good. Okay. Good. Hey, good. Okay. So avoid comma splices. A comma splice is when I've got these two clauses joined, but I'm not using the proper pronunciate pronun <laughs> proper punctuation. Let me get it out of my mouth. Um, <laughs> he prefers a tablet. She prefers her laptop. All I've done here is I've added a comma. It worked here before when I showed you this example. Where was it? I'm looking for where we saw it earlier. Here, she needs a job, comma, and she must expand her skill set. That's almost the same as this. I don't have the word and in here. All I've done is I've used a comma, so I've left that joining word out. So here, here, so I could get around using it, using the joining word. I could just use a semicolon like we did in the other page, or I could do it this way. He prefers a tablet. And instead of using the word and, I could say, however, now what's the difference in the meaning of the sentence if I use and versus if I use however? Hmm. Why, why, why does, why, what does the meaning change to? Let's 
Like she prefers something else than what he prefers? Yeah, it's, it's you're contrasting. If what I'm trying to say is this is yellow, on the other hand, that one's brown. Or he likes tablets, but really she likes laptops more. Then what I'm really, I'm, what I'm emphasizing is how he and she are different. How they're different. Versus if all I want to say is John likes laptops, Jane likes, you know, tablets, and Bob likes desktops. I'm not really trying to create any contrast. I'm just telling you who's who and who likes what. But when I throw the word however, what I'm trying to say is what's important in this sentence is how things are different. Make sense? Yes. Okay. He prefers a tablet. This is exactly like the other one, comma, but she prefers her laptop. This is fine too. Semicolon, however, comma. The thing is, whenever I use the word however, because there's this dumb rule in English that says it has to be this way. If I'm going to use the word however, I have to use a semicolon. If I just want to use the word but, a comma is fine. Now, how would you know that? Because some weirdo someplace in the last 600 years decided that I was going to be a thing. And we've just done it that way ever since. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's pretty much how it works, okay? Sounds like the monkey theory. Monkey see, monkey do? Oh, no. It's the uh, put a, a monkey in the room with a banana, but spray them every time they try to go in there. Put another monkey in there same thing same thing and then you start removing all the monkeys but the monkeys that uh, were sprayed they stopped the other monkeys from getting the banana because they don't want to get sprayed oh so they never know that they end up pulling all the monkeys out and brand new monkeys who have never gotten sprayed and then they just think like nope that's how it's always been done we can't touch the bananas but they don't know why <laughs> That's perfect. <laughs> yeah, we don't know why. It's always been done that way. That's right. <laughs> That's funny. Okay. Um, which has a lot to do with that, my favorite oxymoron of military intelligence. It's just always been done that way. We do it the same way, right? Every time. Yep. Yep. Okay. Prefer short sentences. Now, here's the thing about sentence length and paragraph length. The longer they go, the less people retain. So we want to write in shorter paragraphs. We want to write in shorter sentences. Check this out. Eight words in a sentence, you get 100% understandability. Comprehension means everybody understood it, like spot on, okay? But when I start adding words into this sentence, like at 15 words, comprehension went down 10%. Four more words, I've lost 20% 20 20 of my audience doesn't understand the sentence anymore at 19 words. Now, oh my God, if I got a sentence that's 28 words long, half of my audience has no earthly idea what I'm talking about. Wow. So, right. So, so the lesson here is write in as short a sentence as you can. I call this the goldfish rule. People have the attention of a goldfish. Oh, I so, <laughs> okay. So if you want people to stay in tune with you, speak in short sentences. <laughs> Look, a chicken. There you go. <laughs> like that. <laughs> All right. Um, now, how do we improve our writing? Well, we can look for ways to emphasize the big ideas. If you and I are talking like we are now, and I lean into a word so that you really know it's important, you get it just from the inflection of my voice. Um, if I use an active versus a passive voice, it's a way to emphasize again. If I really don't want you to, um, if I want to focus on what happened instead of who did the action, I'm going to speak in a passive voice. 
I want to emphasize the action, but I want to de-emphasize the doer. So John hit the baseball is active, right? You can see a guy at plate with a bat in his hand. John hit the baseball. But if you say the ball was hit, I still see the action, but I don't know who did it. And now I'm speaking in a passive, not an active voice. So if you're delivering a message that's a difficult message and you don't want the people who made the decision to be shot by the unruly mob outside the front door, you hide his identity. We've decided, or you know, um, instead of saying uh, the CEO changed next year's compensation plan, you could say the compensation plan has been changed. Because you don't know who to blame. <laughs> you don't know who to shoot. Yeah. That's right. In my career, long time ago, I came up with the phrase, the, uh, the all-time, all-inspiring phrase, marketing is the neck. They hang the sign on so they knew who to shoot when things go bad. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good one. Yeah, you know. <laughs> So, um, and it's, and it's, and it's, it's uh, worked for me my entire career, let me tell you. Um, so using, uh, em em emphasizing important ideas, there's ways to do this. There's ways to use change active or passive voice. And then we can use a thing called parallelism and also preventing dangling or misplaced modifiers, which means that you don't wanna ever end a sentence with an adjective or an adverb. And I'll show you an example of that in a few minutes. Parallelism is when I begun a series of bullets, like, you know, we were walking, then we were skipping, and finally we were jumping. My three verbs, walking, jumping, skipping, whatever order I gave it to you, they all end in an ing. I'm following that parallel rule. And it makes it easy for your reader to follow the linearity of what you're saying. But if I were to say, look, first we walked and then we were jumping and finally we ran, it's not parallel anymore. Or first we walked and then we were jumping and tomorrow we will run. Again, it's all over the place, right? So we, that's not parallel. We wanna always use parallel every time we can. And we'll see an example of that. Let's talk about emphasis first. I can create emphasis in um, my language and description of certain things or events, depending on how well I describe those things. If I describe it really well for you, you can get a really <clears throat> clear picture in your mind about what I'm saying. I'm painting a really, really vivid mental movie in your head, okay? Now I could say something general, like she has a new gadget. Okay, Arlen, when I said she has a new gadget, what, what popped up in your head? What, what do you see? A phone. A phone? Yeah. Is that the same thing that uh, you saw, Paul, when I said gadget? No. A watch, a watch, probably like a watch. Paul. Paul, is that is that the same thing you saw? No, it's not. No. What did you see, Paul? I was thinking more like um, tablet or new, new computer. Yeah, you know what I was thinking of? I was thinking of one of those uh, little things on a pinwheel where you blow on it and it spins around and around. It wasn't electronic at all. Okay, that's a gadget for me, right? I'm making that up, by the way. But um, <laughs> you are dating yourself, <laughs> aren't I? Though, actually, I never date myself. Never since I got married do I have to do that anymore. It's much better now, Esmeralda. <laughs> Little TMI for you. Okay, now I instead of saying she has a new gadget, if I really want to make sure that everybody in my audience understands and is clued in, I could say. Instead of she has a new gadget, Lisa loves her new iPad. She, first of all, I don't really know who she is. Paul might have been thinking about Stephanie, but I was thinking about Becky, and Arlen was thinking about Tracy. 
I said she, we all bought it somebody else, totally random. Now there's a difference between having something and loving this thing that you've got now. Has, I really have no idea how you feel about that thing. I just know that you own it. A gadget versus an iPad. Again, world of difference. So if you want to emphasize um, to your audience, your readers, your listeners, and really make sure that they're all really with you on something, speak as clearly and paint as vivid a picture as you can. Someone left a message. Who's someone? What was the message? Yeah, and, and they left it like, like it was a, it was in an envelope with it was a letter that they had received and they left it at Starbucks. What what happened there? To you. Well, it was clear to me, wasn't it clear to you? <laughs> but if I say that Michael Lee called this morning and said he would call again at four p.m., that's a whole lot more specific, isn't it? Yes. One more. That skyscraper is tall. Okay, if, if I'm a quarter of an inch high and this skyscraper is really just a box of matches, <laughs> it's, it's colossal, right? <laughs> you see my point? <laughs> it's, it's all about your perspective. So oh, the Burj Khalia in Dubai, hey, you are in Afghanistan. Did you ever get to Dubai? No. Okay. That, was is, not like that is so far from yeah, Dubai. <laughs> I have no idea, man. You know, I, I live in Orange <laughs> County. <laughs> what, what do I know? I know it's Middle East. That's all I know. I live right between them. I used to. Really? Yeah, I'm from uh, Baghdad. Okay. Or Iraq. Yeah. Very cool. So have you been to the Burj Khalia? Oh, yeah, all right. <laughs> Burj Khalifa. Oh, yeah, uh, uh, Burj Khalifa? Burj Khalifa. Kind of like Wiz Khalifa. But oh, it's, so it's spelt wrong on this page, too. There's a missing <laughs> F. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Good to know. So that's the building that Tom Cruise did the Mission Impossible scene in, isn't it? Uh... I believe so. I'm too young to know that. Okay, sorry. Young to know Tom Cruise? Jeez. No, I'm just, I'm just an immigrant. I don't know any movies. I'm, I'm still thinking Top Gun here, but anyway, okay. <laughs> yeah, all right. Label the main idea. So now, let's say that we're in the middle of a presentation, and I've been talking for a while, but I'm talking all around this, and we don't have the benefit of my PowerPoint slides to keep you guys focused on where I am, how do I lead you through so that you're easily following my document, my oral presentation, whatever? Here's a sentence that gives you an example of that. Explore the possibility of leasing a site, but also hire a consultant. In this sentence, which is the most important idea? You wouldn't know it. I wouldn't what, know it. Yeah. I'm guessing. What do you think? Um, Marcellus, I haven't heard, you heard from you for a while. What's the most important part of that sentence? Are you with us? I think my brother Marcellus has checked out. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, I would say that we wouldn't know it. Esmeralda is dead on target with that. Not labeled, explore the possibility of leasing a site, but most importantly, hire. Now we all know what we're really emphasizing here, right? Exactly. If I want to emphasize the most important idea, I can either put it at the beginning of a list of things, I can put it at the end of a list of things, or I can make it the sentence subject. Now, if I put it at the beginning of a long list, and it's the first thing you hear, they call this the primary, the primacy effect. You remember it, and the primacy effect is you remember it, 
because it was among the first things that you experienced. Um, latency effect is you remember it because it was one of the last things you heard. And you, so you, so it stayed with you. Wouldn't that be affected by the length of whatever, say for example, an example, it was like the first thing you were, it was an important thing, but it was the first thing that was mentioned, but then the list gets long and long, and long, you're not going to remember it anymore. Correct. It kind of depends on the length of the context or the paper or whatever it is. This is true. This is true. Now, one way that we make things easy for um, our readers uh, to follow a long list like that is instead of burying it into a big long paragraph where you have to actually sort through and track everything is we will create a list of bullet points instead. Okay. Then it just kind of leaps out at you. You see it visually. Now here's an unemphatic example. Labor lawyers say that companies should review their internship programs because most often they're illegal if interns are not being paid for their work. That's a mouthful. Isn't it though? So what's the most important part of that sentence? Gee whiz, we don't know. <laughs> now, if we wanna do better than that, first of all, the other thing that was really horrible about this sentence is it, is it, is it longer than eight words? Oh, yes. Oh, it's way too long, right? Now, how about this one here? What have we got? We got one, two, three, four, five. Six. We got 10 words. Still pretty good. We probably still in the 80, 90% retention. Better than this 5,000 word one. 25 words. Wow. That's awful. <laughs> Yep. Okay. So most internship programs are illegal if interns are not paid. Look, is it important that labor lawyers say this? No. No, no it's not. You know, is it really important that we're talking about um, uh, internship programs or what kind of work they're doing? Mm -hmm. Not so much, right? What's the important point? If you got an intern working for you, you have to pay them. There you go. Because we, you know, did away with the other idea with the 13th Amendment. Now go back to Texas and tell them about that with their vo voter restriction laws. Okay, besides the point, isn't it? Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm not a happy camper these days with our United States, you guys. Uh, I'm not. right there with you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> is, this the company, is this the country that you went to fight for? Nope. Nope. I signed up just before 9-11. Wow. Man. So you went right, you were there in, was it Desert, no, not Desert Storm. What was it called? Um, Operation Iraqi Freedom. Iraqi, yeah, they had that big battleship or aircraft carrier, right? Mission accomplished. Remember that? Yeah. Yeah, that was a hoot. Okay. 20 years later, did we accomplish it? Turned out to be almost like Vietnam. Yeah. Now use active, so we wanna express things clearly. Money was lost is not as clear as we lost money, is it? Because money was lost doesn't really tell you, does it personally impact you? Like, like a wallet was stolen is really a different feeling than, than saying, hey, somebody just reached into your hip pocket and took your money. Totally, yeah. different, totally different feeling from that. Now use passive voice verbs to de-emphasize the performer or to be tactful. That's what I was saying before. If we don't want everyone to know that the CEO decided to pay us less next year, we're gonna say the compensation plan has mysteriously been altered. We don't know who done it. And if we, but if we wanna see if we can't get the board of directors to give us a new CEO, we might say the other thing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. 
money was lost and the new law was recently passed. Congress recently passed the new law. Well, that's what blame. Yeah, and, and, and it was a good law. Well, they don't say that. Okay. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> it's one we can all be proud of. No, they didn't say that either. Okay, um, use active voice for directness, vigor, and clarity. Indirect and less clear in the passive voice. We'll compare these two and you'll see how one is not as clear as the other. Remember, clarity is certainly important. Think back to the Sherpas and how they had to be super, super careful that those little blind kids didn't fall off the mountain, right? Yep. So we have to lay down the trail super careful with the way that we outline and arrange our documentation. So here we go. A customer service blog was started last year. That's not as clear as Rosario started a customer service blog last year. It's more interesting to me that um, uh, who did it, for instance, in this case. I want to know because I want to know, you know, who to you know, reward for their hard work. The economy is expected to improve eventually. <laughs> One day. One day. By the way, I read, uh, I read uh, about six months ago a report that was put out by Harvard Business Review, so you would think that they would know, that says that this present recession that we're in should lift sometime in the 2030s, you guys. Wow. Isn't that good news? <laughs> Depends on who you are. Depends on, yes, or when you're graduating. Um, the government expects the economy to improve. Well, okay, so the economy is expected. Who expects? You know, the wino at the end of the street corner down there, he's expecting it to improve now. But the government, who is apparently supposed to be, you know, all knowing and things about, you know, macroeconomics, they expect it to improve. That means a whole lot more to me. Yes. Right. Okay. And we're getting sort of near um, the end. We'll finish this section. I'm going to let you guys finish the reading for yourselves for the week. Does that sound like a good plan? Yeah. Okay. Sure. I, I don't ever yes. want to burn you guys out. Passive voice to emphasize the action, but not the doer. Remember, we said if I want to, if I want to tell you what happened, but I want to do a little CYA on behalf of, you know, Joe Biden. It wasn't his idea to pull us out of Afghanistan like that. Mm -hmm. And less tactful in the active voice. We cannot grant you credit. If you're the person who <clears throat> applied for that credit card and they come back and they tell you no, and they say, we decided, you know who you can get mad at, right? Yes. But it's more tactful to say credit somehow mysteriously cannot be granted. <laughs> the, the powers the, that be say the, yes yes the powers on high <laughs> the hospital cannot admit patients without insurance all right patients without insurance cannot be admitted as much as the board of directors and the chief surgeon and all the doctors and nurses and everybody around here holding our handkerchiefs in front of our eyes, dabbing away our tears and sending away the poor child with cancer because you can't pay your bill. We're oh so sorry, but someone's not allowing us to let you in. Yeah. yeah. And that happens. Our CEO missed his estimate on this quarter's profits. Now, if you wanna go to work next month at the same company, you're probably not going to ever say our CEO missed his estimate. Oh, no. No, what you're going to do is the same thing that the CEO does. And you're going to say it's those lousy sales and marketing guys that hurt me and my great vision about being able to take this company forward. Let's fire them and get a whole new crew in here. Or you could say quarterly profits missed their estimates. Because these quarterly profits have minds of their own. 
They're all yep, they generate themselves. They do, right? They know where to go. They know what was expected of them. And those damn dollars, they just didn't show up on time. <laughs> yes. yes. Okay, you guys, any questions on anything that I've told you about this evening? No. No? No, sir. Okay. No. I have a question um, about the product. Yeah, talk, talk to me. Let's talk about it. So you... Uh, like earlier when you said that uh, basically part of the uh, the writing will be bullet points, right? Yes. So like part of the paper will be in bullet points. And then the most important part is what we think about yes. success. What, in our words, what is success? Yes. And, and um, um, Alexandria, I think that you were the one that had this question in the, in the beginning. So uh, can you answer uh, um, Marcellus's was, question for me? It was actually Arlen. Oh, it was Arlen. Was okay. Me. Yeah. Arlen, talk to me. So basically, it's um, writing bullet points about the article and stuff, and just like to do like a brief summary about it, like write what the questions ask in the prompt, and then in your own words you're going to write about what success is to you based on what you read and stuff like that. Yeah. And, and to put a little bit finer point on it, you're going to read a total of eight articles this week, Marcellus. All you guys are. Okay. And as you read them, as you're reading, I want you to take notes about what you're reading. Okay. Instead of making you guys write all of that up into a big essay, I want you to take the notes, the main points that you picked up in all the reading that you did and turn those into bullet points. And then just sort of look at it and say, okay, this is what I've just learned about. And you could take those bullet points and you might, it might be a really good idea to take those bullet points and categorize them. Cause you might see through the reading that you do that there are some common threads or themes that come up multiple times as you're going through it, okay? Then once you've done all that summary and the bullets and categorizing them how you think you might want to, then put it aside for a while, a day or two maybe, and just have a think, you know, about the stuff that, that you read about and what it, how it strikes you and what it could mean to you in your life how you personally think to you, you, you personally are going to define success in your life based on who you are, not based on what these writers had to say. I'm having you read those guys just to give you a background on how certain people see the world and the way you might think about it. But what I'm really after is I really, really want to know Marcellus super well. I want you to really explain to me for you, not for those other people that you read about, but just for you, if you achieve certain things in your life, what's gonna make you feel like you're a success? Got it. Okay. Yeah, okay. Are, are all of you guys clear on that? I want this, I want you guys to be super, because I'm setting this, because we're going to do this sort of thing throughout this project. So this is the first one. So I want us to be really clear on what I'm looking for. Because I this whole exercise or project is one about you learning stuff and then you doing something with it. You take it to the personal important place in your life for what it's supposed to be about. Got See it. Yeah, I got it. I got it. Okay. Yeah, good. I want, I, I want you guys, and I think you guys are going to tell me some amazing things. I can't wait to hear what you guys have to say. Awesome. Okay, well, then that's all I've got for you guys for tonight. Thank you for, the, um, for being very participative. And uh, uh, did you guys enjoy the evening? I did. Yes, uh, sir. Yes. You make my Tuesdays a little bit better. Oh, <laughs> that's a really nice thing to say. <laughs> all right, you guys. Um, thank you so much. Esmeralda, can you hang on a second again real quick before we all drop off? All right, you guys have a killer night. 
Talk to me in you the as well, professor. Meeting. All right, man. See ya. Have a good night. Bye. Take it easy. See ya. Have a good night. See ya. Good night, professor. Bye bye. So um, my daughter is not up for it yet. She's still feeling really down. I, I just wanted to get back to you about it. Oh yeah, no worries. That sounds, it's whenever she's up for it, I'm totally open to it. You're so sweet, thank you. Yeah, and uh, you know, if, even if she wants, if she, there's no um, pressure for her to ride or anything like that, just to come over. Yeah interact with the animals a little bit and just get it'd be so house. good for her. yeah um i i am totally open to it um actually as a matter of fact um that's kind of why i started the ranch is that right yes i uh, being a, a disabled vet myself uh and my husband being active duty we were looking to set up a ranch where we could invite other veterans um other disabled individuals who could use a little bit of therapy and get away out of their own heads and just wow. brush their brush some horses, interact with the animals, and not necessarily have feel any pressure to do anything. That is such an amazing, amazing thing to want to do. How are you coming along with that? Well, I've acquired the animals. <laughs> I haven't acquired the rest of it. All right. If you ever get around to wanting to do that, I'd love to maybe help you pull, pull that together a little bit. Oh, I really, really appreciate that. Um, I would love to do something like that. Yeah, I that was the, the initial idea. Um, there's just uh, two downsides right now. Um, apparently, my chickens have uh, are suffering. We, we just lost a couple of chickens. Oh. Um, it seems like we may have gotten Merrick's disease onto the chickens and that can come from anywhere uh mostly what is merrick's disease uh it is a disease that affects them internally um it basically just kills them there's nothing that we can do wow uh, it comes from birds wild birds that come into the coop to also eat of their feathers the dust on their feathers will transmit the disease so my so, mm -hmm. so the the wild birds have the disease too or they're yeah. or they're immune they're immune they can just carry it from flock to flock a flock uh it affects chickens quails and turkeys wow um, so there's nothing we can do um there's no cure there's no there, there is a vaccine but the vaccine needed to be administered when they're in the egg or just hatched oh yeah how so. would you ever know Exactly. I didn't know until now that I'm experiencing it and I'm starting to lose my flock. So there's a good chance I could lose 90% um, of the flock. Oh, uh, so yeah, I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm trying to deal with that. I'm trying to hopefully pull the ones that are currently sick and somehow some of them survive. But um, yeah, uh, that's one of the things I'm dealing with. Uh, the last thing, which thankfully it's not going to affect during our semester, but my husband does have orders to Texas. Oh. Uh, so that's supposed to be happening in March. Uh, actually, February, it's supposed to be uh, March 1st uh, by the time he has to be reporting to Fort Worth. So are you guys staying here or are you guys going to sell the ranch and go to Texas? Um, looking worst case scenario is actually renting the ranch. Because I want to keep this place. I mean, yeah. it's the central location. The town is building everywhere around us. Wow. Um, and there's no place like it. And since there's just so many vets out here, there it's just a great place to set something up like what I was mentioning um, that I started off with. Yeah. So I'm I'm hoping I'm hoping that you know we'll we'll see what happens. Um, you know if we may end up moving to texas partially the idea um behind that um it is more affordable mm. more affordable to feed the, the horses out there as well overall just completely um and as a disabled veteran because i am 100 percent disabled what happened uh, can i ask you i'm sorry i said what happened can i ask you uh i suffer my disability is 100 I have injuries, physical injuries. Um, I I took a 20 foot fall um, and I blacked out. So I actually have a TBI. 
and then I've also dealt with a variety of traumas. So I have disability for my injuries, which add up to approximately 70%, but I'm also wow. 100% disabled for wow. being alone. Wow. Yeah. I'm so sorry to hear that. Yeah. So then, you know, with you mentioning your daughter and what she's dealing with, I can, I can completely comprehend. Um, yeah, it's a hard thing to watch her go through. Yeah. I, yeah, it's, I've been through the gamut and uh, one of the things that really, really affected me and part of why I built this ranch as well. Um, I just started losing friend after friend after friend. I mean, these are like my brothers. I mean, mm. um, that to suicide after our deployment. And, PTSD, that kind of thing. Yeah. Brutal. Yeah. So that's why um, this whole thing with Afghanistan as of late has been so hard for us. Um, because you lost really good people and for what now, right? Exactly. Exactly. So brutal. You know, we went out there, we did what we needed to do. Um, but at the same time, something like this happening, um, because yes, although we needed it to leave Afghanistan, it there's absolutely no reason that things cannot be negotiated and done and, and phased out. Um, and uh, I guess I'm a believer in, you know, your, your term, your, your space, your responsibility, nobody else's responsibility. Yeah. So. Um, but you know, the, uh, the Taliban, would they have allowed that to let us pull out slow? They don't seem like the most reasonable Oh, that kind of people. You know, it, it's funny because so I was involved in intelligence when I when I deployed to Afghanistan. My main job was um, I was a weather forecaster, mm. and um, I was attached to First Marine Division. And my main job out there wasn't just to forecast what the weather was going to do. And it was to be able to tell whether or not our missions were going to go, mm. because depending on what the weather was going to do, my it, it, the insane pressure was I was not an officer yet. I was telling a bunch of officers and generals, hey, this cannot go because you're not going to have, you know, the vehicles. You're not you're going to have this kind of visibility, which is going to affect this It's going to affect 